media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, recycling trade publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is market historian Bob Hoy. He's the chief investment strategist for ChartsAndMarkets.com. He's speaking to us from Vancouver. Welcome back to the show, Bob. Yeah, hi, Jim. Always a Friday get-together is fun, and... uh... We've had some interesting action in the financial markets. And uh, as usual, we have uh, so many listener questions, so we'll get right to them. From Lesko, uh, the question is, interest rates are spiking in Australia. Should spiking interest rates be coming to the United States and Canada? Yeah, this is sort of uh, a vague format for the question, but... uh what has happened, of course, with the boom is that the uh, longer dated uh, low grade bonds like junk and high yield have become very popular and their interest rates have gone down. So the trick in here is to watch the uh, watch the junk bond and it is just early stages of rolling over and beginning to violate some technical lines. So by this measure, uh, long rates can go up, but in also against this, uh, there's a contrast whereby the long-dated treasuries in the U.S. may become uh, uh, a safe haven uh, item, and the uh, the bond future came down and bottomed at about 158 uh, last week, and uh, we thought it was building a base from which a rally could occur. So on questions about interest rates, one wants to be uh, discussing uh, short rates, uh, 10-year or 20- or 30-year bonds. You also want to be um, discussing whether you're talking about high-grade or low-grade. But uh, let's go. I think I get the gist of your question. From Hugh, hi, Bob and Jim. As interest rates move higher, could real estate crash while the stock markets continue to move higher? Uh, no. I remember in Vancouver in 1980, uh, 81, when uh, long-dated uh, Government of Canada bonds got up to 19%, and in the U.S. they were up to something like 15%, and the rate of inflation was a 15%, and I had some friends who were making money in Vancouver real estate then. And then when the market started to falter for real estate, uh, the conviction amongst speculators in real estate was that, oh, interest rates will come down and the party will continue. But as we know from any business cycle work, that uh, interest rates generally go up in a boom and down in the bust. So here these guys were all uh, over leveraged in real estate and thinking that interest rates coming down would get the party going again. No. Uh, in Vancouver here up in the uh, high-end British properties uh, area, the, from 1980-81 high, about four or five years later, they had fallen to one-third of the high. So to put this in today's context, uh, prices in Vancouver are way higher than then in a relative sense and uh, could be vulnerable. And uh, it would be a classic whereby the T-bill rate would be declining as real estate goes down and as also commodity prices, after being highly speculative, may go down as well. Again, uh, Hugh, thanks for the question, and uh, but you should be a little more specific about which interest rates you're discussing. Bob Hoy, question from Charlie. 
Hi, Bob. I always enjoy your chats with Jim and appreciate your view of the economic world and how it differs from the mainstream. A few questions have me curious of your view, given your predictions of a severe correction coming soon. I keep hearing a number of analysts talking about money on the sidelines and how that should continue to power markets upward and onward for some time to come. Will this have any impact on the drop you're predicting? Also, from what I was able to dig up, it looks like interest rates were about 6% during the 1929 crash. Given that they are essentially zero at the moment, can this help avert a crash? Looking forward to your insights. Thanks, Charlie. Yeah, good one. The um, Again, it's the same thing. Uh, Generally, interest rates go up. Uh, like short dated, long dated in in a uh, in a business expansion. Uh, then uh, in 1929, of course, the uh, in August of 1929, the Federal Reserve raised their discount rate to six uh, percent, and uh, the uh, New York Times had an article with it uh, that was pointing out that the Fed was concerned about the horrendous speculation in the financial markets and their strategy was to tighten money to Wall Street and at the same time ease money to Main Street. The T-bill rate, uh, which really runs things, reached its high, oh, it's something like 5% in May of 1929 and then in heading down signaled that the party was over. Now, this also... With interest rates now um, repressed, that's a good term, artificially low, uh, to an extraordinary level, it's there, there are some distortions. But, for example, in September 2007, as uh, credit markets were already changing, uh, the uh, stock market was uh, very speculative. And at that time, uh, the... Uh, Big name financial types were saying that there was no problem ahead because the Federal Reserve would lower interest rates and that would keep the party going. Uh, not understanding that for thousands of years, short dated interest rates go up in the boom and down in the contraction. So. And then at that time, I remember I wrote an, uh, one of our regular publications outlined that uh, that, not, uh, that with the theory about interest, lowering interest rates uh, would add another leg onto the stock market. We pointed out that what happens actually is that the fastest drops in the stock market occurred with the fastest drop in short rates and. Uh, my view is that the uh, financial markets um, drive things, and the uh, Federal Reserve is just along for the ride. So uh, when uh, eventually, uh, back in 2007, the uh, the T-bill rate had set the downtrend, and then the Fed had no alternative but to uh, follow and they cut their rates to something like a quarter of 1%, and the uh, the bill, T-bill rate went down to effectively zero. And also, uh, the T-bill rate went to effectively zero following the 1929 boom. So uh, the concept of interest rates, you need to divide into two sectors. One is market rates of interest, which is day-to-day trade by the whole of the world, and then all of the nonsense about Federal Reserve setting the Fed funds rate, or in the 1920s they called it the discount rate, which they were all excited about. And uh, So there's a one is real, which is your market rates of interest day-to-day, and the other is unreal, which is the notion that the Fed can... Uh, all change, change things by setting interest rates. So, uh, Josh, uh, all our questions today so far have been about interest rates. Our uh, fourth questioner is uh, from Michael. Hello, Jim and Bob. Wow, this market is on steroids. As I understand it, 
The Fed plans to start tapering the monetary heroin, but is ready to inject more as needed in the event the market throws a hissy fit following a 2% correction. Bob, is it the Fed that is feeding the markets, or is it the big banks with plentiful available margin debt? Yeah, the that's again this elusive uh, concepts in interest rates uh, in, in the in in uh, times in the past uh, like the Bank of England was on a gold standard and had certain disciplines and could not be too reckless but uh, the interest rates uh, go up and down uh, all on their own and the and the uh, the central bank had a tendency to follow. Now, as to the uh, monetary heroin, the the market without a central bank, or let's go back to the 1800s when the Bank of England was disciplined by gold, the market would create huge amounts of credit during a speculative bubble through the bank's and via straight direct stock market margin through the brokers. And it then also you have this concept of velocity of money or velocity of credit, which has to do with the rate of turnover. So I can point out that every great financial boom, uh, the private sector can generate more than enough credit on its own just through margin. And then it's, sort of exaggerated by then the velocity of turnover. So in a financial bubble, there's never any shortage of credit. And then when you get into the contraction and prices start going down, the power shifts over the margin clerk, and their uh, job description is to get the accounts in line, which they do. And so then what happens is that the velocity of money turns down, over, uh, largely driven by, you know, market forces, people, you know, trying to cover their positions and stuff like that. So the net result of this is that in a, in a boom, the private sector can create all the credit it needs and it always looks ample and, uh, you don't need the Fed. And then when the contraction comes, the, um, declining velocity overwhelms whatever funds the Fed could put in. And there's an essay in Barron's from July 1932, and the uh, text of it is that uh, it's observed that every anti-deflationary measure taken by the Fed is seen not to work, because July 1932 was the the end of the abysmal... uh, first post-bubble bear market, and uh, they've also pointed out that the uh, anti-deflationary measure was the Fed buying bonds out of the market. So then I went through uh, weekly uh, Barron's magazine, uh, a newspaper plus the Economist, and made notes years ago, and what happened in July 1932 at that bottom is the supply of of bonds, corporate bonds, just uh, and the the unrelenting selling quit, and then it was like a couple of weeks of vacuum, and then suddenly the street discovered that the unrelenting selling of bonds had ended, and vavoom, away away went the market. So the uh, I think this next contraction, when it comes, uh, I think the uh, there's uh, many e- e- economists could suddenly acquire critical facilities and point out the uh, absurdity of an intervention of central bank. And at the same time, the public's going to look at the trillions of dollars that have been thrown into financial markets in order to prevent bad things from happening. So they're going to look at bad things and look at the amount of money the Fed wasted. So I think that the... uh, Federal Reserve is going to go into a, a period of uh, uh, severe criticism by both econ- economists and the public. Uh, so it's going to be fascinating. And thank, 
No, but there's another part of the question. Yes, there was. Uh, the second part of the question from Michael. Many were expecting a lasting low in the precious metal sector in November, December, based on a stock market sell-off in October into November. That hasn't happened yet. Does that push off that low in the precious metal sector into 2022? Yeah, that was mainly my view since last summer that uh, there could be uh, could have been a uh, the discovery of a liquidity problem in the fall. That's the classic time to discover it. But what happened here was beginning in September, all of a sudden there was a huge rotation into uh, commodities that had been overlooked. You had aluminum, um, crude oil, natural gas, uh, all these things suddenly took off. And then some of the exotics like lithium and cobalt as well took off. And that then provided a positive period when a credit problem could have been discovered. So it's been pushed off. Now, <laughs> oddly enough, I stayed with the notion that golds may find a low in November. Let's push it out to December. Our technical work will be alert for it, and uh, hopefully we can catch a low for golds. Now, the irony here is that uh, in a post-bubble contraction, the real price of gold goes up, and that reflects um, profit margins for gold miners. And when it's going up, they make money in a post-bubble deflation. So the thing that prompts the post-bubble contraction is a failure in the financial market, which has yet to happen, but it's looking like it's on the edge. So uh, the, uh, we're watching for a key buying point in for gold stocks because it's going to be followed by a multi-year bull market where, the, such for example, the GDXJ will outperform the S&P. And there's a nicety uh, in addition to this is that after a year or so of gold stocks outperforming the S&P, there's going to be many portfolio managers out there who would not otherwise include gold positions, and they're going to look at that and realize that in order to get that percent gain, they're going to have to buy the gold. So I think it's going to be, when it turns, a long and terrific bull market for golds that would uh, cover the Oh, the senior golds, the midland-sized gold, and particularly the exploration stocks. I think there'll be some fabulous discoveries and some terrific plays in the gold market. So, but we have to be patient here over the next uh, month or so. So, and thank you for the questions. We'll have more with Bob Hoy right after this. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts radio and articles delivered to your inbox sign up for the howstreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at howstreet.com welcome back we're speaking with bob hoy bob some of the headlines that caught your attention today bank of america sees crude hitting 120 dollars a barrel by june yeah i think that's a little extrapolation going on the a large spectrum of the investment community has got onto the idea that Suddenly, we're going to get back uh, the 1970s uh, inflation in commodities and that sort of stuff. And I like to remind people that uh, the 1970s inflation was quite like the 1910s inflation. And it led to uh, uh, a global boom in commodities in 1920 and a crash. And then you went into the period where you have uh, the next thing becomes inflation and financial assets. And uh, that was the action to 1929 in stocks and bonds. And then when it crashed, then you go into the post-bubble deflation. So uh, I think this one is kind of extrapolation. I know that uh, right now we're looking at crude oil and the technical uh, aspects on the momentum side are getting kind of excessive, like we're beginning to get some upside exhaustions, and then also we're looking for the completion of a sequential cell. Uh, so uh, there are trading and research side that says that the 
a large part of the enthusiasm about crude oil is already in the market. So, uh, but uh, $120 target, which reminds of of uh, June, July 2008, when crude oil got up to 147, and it it generated uh, technical excesses that are building now. So the this high now in the let's call it say 85 is now beginning to generate technical patterns similar to when it was at 140 in uh, 2008. So it's it's an interesting uh, it'll be an interesting trade when it comes in. Another headline Americans' biggest fear is corrupt government officials. Nearly 80% are worried about government corruption. Uh, climate change, uh, 48%. Yeah, this is fascinating. It was a list of, uh, of, uh, survey, uh, and this was posted in Zero Hedge. So, uh, here you had this that the, uh, that uh, the biggest concern is corrupt government officials, and it's up to 80%, which is fantastic. Um, other, like, uh, concerns about major epidemics at 56%. And one that was interesting was the, the uh, concerns about climate change, which this study was done, uh, well, back in 2019. And the uh, cl- fear of climate change ranked uh, about number nine, in the list then, and it's now dropped to 13 on this latest uh, uh, survey, and it's at 48%. So where the climate change people and government, uh, and particularly with the COP meeting in Glasgow, the world is just full of hysteria about climate, and that's at the side who that benefits from the climate change hysteria they all these bureaucrats get cushy jobs and memberships and clubs and get to go to well i wouldn't say that glasgow is a wonderful place but uh, they get these fabulous trips and all that sort of stuff but the ordinary citizen is not hysterical about it and probably beginning to become a little fed up about it so uh, this would be interesting to uh to watch on this survey. It's a terrific one. So, yep. Uh, An observation made by uh, the uh, Republican politician Rubino. Rubio? I should say Rubio. He says the political dividing line is crazy versus normal. (laughs) Yeah, so, but uh, nowadays with the left and... uh, the middle of the road people, uh, it's very clear to see who is crazy. Mind you, the left and not, uh, looks at ordinary folk and not being hysterical about climate or COVID, uh, uh, think that the ordinary folk are crazy. But all you need is, uh, some political history to point out that, I mean, if these guys are really insane, First of all, Biden administration did everything it could to cut oil and gas production. They hate it. So, well, guess what happens? The cost of energy soars, and then they get a bit of heat from it nine months later, and Biden then pleads with OPEC to produce more oil in order to keep the price from going up. Uh, and they are, the left is absolutely convinced that the world will run without oil and, and gas. It is absolutely amazing. They think the whole of the world could be run on sunshine and wind. And as we know, those are intermittent. Like the sun doesn't shine at nighttime and the wind doesn't blow all the time. So, the irony is, Jim, that for every unit increase in capacity for wind or solar power has to be backed up by the equivalent unit of power that isn't interrupted. So that means power from uh, hydro, which 
uh, is limited. You got to have a lot of water and and uh, a drop for that one. And then you've got coal, and you've got uranium, and you've got natural gas. So uh, these are very concentrated uh, power, de- high density power that are that is not interrupted. And yet the uh, the left wants to have everything on power that is interruptible and is also a very low density source of power. So they're taking the absolute worst decision, and they're out to absolutely destroy a reliable and efficient energy system, and they're destroying it faster then they can replace it with interrupted power. So who's crazy? <laughs> the, uh, the, the climate uh, hysterical guys are uh, clearly uh, irrational. So, uh, and, we'll, and I think more and more people are going to figure this out. Bob, thank you so much for chatting with us. Yeah, Jim, good to be with you and look forward to next week. My guest has been market historian Bob Hoy, the chief investment strategist for chartsandmarkets.com. Bob loves to answer your questions. You can send them to info at howstreet.com. Our YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. Find us on Twitter at Howstreet. We're also on Facebook. I'm Jim Goddard. Thank you for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com, HowStreet.com radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.